Good evening and welcome to the Douglas Leadership Institute and Frederick Douglass Foundation monthly Leaders Live call. Uh, it is always a blessing to uh, have these calls <clears throat> and for uh, each of you to join us. It blesses me to see the various names and faces coming across the screen. Uh, we are appreciative uh, of you and the work that you do in your various uh, families, communities, cities, and states uh, across this great nation. Um, I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer. My name is Arnold Albrecht, and I serve as Director of Ministry Engagement with the Douglas Leadership Institute. We've got a fantastic uh, guest on tonight that's going to share some, um, some uh, great information and resources in the education uh, educational opportunity space. And uh, it is always our prayer that when you leave the call, that you've been encouraged, that you've been inspired, that you've been resourced to go back and do what you do at um, uh, an even greater level. So let me open us with prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to have dialogue, God, concerning matters that are of concern to you. Father, we realize that things are, uh, are getting darker and darker in the world in which we live, as you prophesied it would in your word. But Father, we thank you that you've called us, your people, to be light and to release life. Father, we open our hearts, we open our minds to receive tonight. Father, if there's anyone on the call that's had a challenging or frustrating day, Father God, will you just release grace and release peace to them that when they get off of this call, they've been uplifted being in the company of like-minded um, um, soldiers in the battle. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, these calls are for the purpose of uh, ministerial and organizational engagement and education. Uh, they are not intended for the press. Uh, the call will be facilitated. The discussion tonight will be facilitated by the uh, chairman of the Douglas Leadership Institute and the uh, Frederick Douglass Foundation, uh, Bishop Dean Nelson. And uh, Dean, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Amen. Thank you so much, Apostle Colbreth. And it is great to see all of you on. Uh, if those of you who have joined us um, uh, know of friends or uh, individuals that uh, you think would benefit from tonight's discussion, uh, particularly as we delve into uh, education and uh, engaging Black men, uh, we would ask you to use the link that you received and you can forward that via email uh, or text to someone that can join us tonight. Uh, can be reminded that, again that these are recorded and will be rebroadcast. But we are excited tonight at uh, the Douglas Leadership Institute and the Frederick Douglass Foundation to have a special guest. Uh, every month we have some fantastic leaders uh, on this call. But tonight, uh, this young man stands out because he probably is the youngest of our uh, participants and guests that we have had on this program. He's also unique in that I have never personally met him, although many of our uh, staff and uh, DLI and FDF members have. I, uh, I have heard great things about him, have listened to some of his interviews and read some of his information. But King Randall, uh, passionate about the growth and development of boys to men, uh, stands out for his success in empowering boys to be stand-up members of the community in our society. A former United States Marine, King Randall was alarmed by the high level of crime in his hometown. The young offenders were mainly black males as young as 11 years old. This inspired a, a spark in him to be the change that the community needed. Uh, to be the role model these young men were missing in their lives with a dream so passionate for young people, King Randall, the founder of the X for Boys program, has received numerous compliments for his transformational program. Founded in 2019, this program is the only rehabilitative program for juvenile offenders in South Georgia. He has received 
uh, acclaim uh, and awards from many different sectors. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the biggest claim to fame that uh, put him on the map really for me uh, was a sparring match that he had with Roland Martin. And some of you are probably familiar with that. And uh, whenever we have somebody that uh, does a good job of going toe to toe with Roland Martin, that's a good thing to me and they should be commended. But then uh, when they are young people, men and women who are willing to stand up and do better for our communities, man, those are the people that we can rally behind. And so I'm excited tonight to have King Randall on this program to hear um, a little bit about his journey uh, what God has in store for him now, and how we as the Douglas Leadership Institute and the Frederick Douglass Foundation can come around and support uh, efforts like his. So, King Randall, welcome to the Frederick Douglass Foundation and Douglas Leadership Institute's monthly Leaders Live call. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I know we've been trying to make this happen for a minute, mm -hmm. um, but I got some downtime now. Our school is wrapping up uh, at this particular moment, um, we our last day is on uh, May 30th, and they're getting through on milestones and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, had, had some free time. I'm glad to be here. Yes, sir. Hey, man. Well, look, we're glad that you were able to take out some time. Uh, we have a, a great group of leaders that joined this call, and um, we're just excited. And I know that they're going to be blessed by what they hear from you. So usually, man, when we get started, I just invite uh, our guests to tell us a little bit about uh, where they grew up and a little bit about their uh, their childhood and what kind of shaped and made them into the persons that they are. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up, man. Sure. Uh, I'm from the city of Albany, Georgia. Um, this is uh, about two and a half hours south of Atlanta, about an hour from the Florida Georgia line and about an hour and a half from Tallahassee, Florida. So that gives you an idea where we are geographically. Um, but at this particular moment, um, yeah, Albany, Georgia is my hometown. Um, I was born and raised here. Um, I've lived here all my, my life. I uh, went to elementary, middle, and high school here. Um, I got my associate's degree um, from Albany Technical College. I graduated high school at, from Westover High School. Um, I have my associate's degree in culinary. Um, I grew up on the east side of town. What they call it the dark side now. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a... Um, it's like, but it's like the southeast side. It's like a middle of the south and the east. So they call it the dark side because that's where a lot of stuff happens, or whatever. Yeah. But um, I credit uh, my family, my grandmother, um, my, my mom, my stepdad, uh, my uncles, my grandfather, all these men, you know, and women for helping to mold me into how, who I am. I'm at a full village growing up. I learned how to do a whole lot. Uh, we grew all of our own food. Uh, we took care of animals. Uh, we took care of the neighborhood. Um, you know, that's what we did. That's what I grew up doing and, and watching my parents do. Um, we learned how to lay bricks, paint cars, weld, skin animals, go fishing, you name it. I did some of everything, you know, growing up. And um, and that's something that I, you know, pride myself on um, because a lot of young men don't know how to do these things anymore. And I know a lot of people always call me an old man. Like a lot of my people around me always call me old because I, I do a lot of old stuff or what have you, traditional things. Um, but these are things that we saw made successes in our community. Um, and that's what I believe in trying to get back to. Sure, with a little modern twist to it, but for the most part, um, those traditional values is what I believe in because that's how I was raised and that's what I saw thrive uh, growing up. Um, but yeah, that's um, who I am and a brief description of where I grew up. Man, um, there's a lot I could say about that because you are, uh, how old are you now? Like 25? I'm 23 now. 23. 23, 23. Mm -hmm. 23. Man, that, that, is, uh, that is amazing. Um, you know, as you say those things, immediately I, I am taken back to my hometown. Uh, there are a few people that are on this call that uh, live uh, in Fauquier County. It's a it's a rural county in Virginia uh, mm -hmm. that's probably about sixty miles or so outside of Washington D.C. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up. My grandfather, you know, raised hogs, so I saw how they kill pigs. You know, my yes, grandfather sir. had a had a farm. My grandfather drove what they called the honey wagon, which meant that he drove around and cleaned white people's uh, septic tanks. And um, ah, he, made, okay. he made good money doing that. And uh, he right. purchased in the 1950s, you know, over 70 acres of land uh, for a black man in rural Virginia. Purchasing that uh, was, uh, was not something that was ordinary. Um, he had more I didn't understand it when I was growing up, but I asked, I said, you know, he had more guns, uh, you know, in his house than he did, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, a lot of other stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't understand that, you know, growing up in rural, you know, Virginia, you needed to, uh, to protect yourself because uh, it was no guarantee that the law or law enforcement was going to be on your side. So right. I, having said all of that, man, I just think that a lot of uh, people that grew up, you know, not in these, you know, huge metropolises, but Black people that grew up in some of these rural areas, I mean, it's almost by nature, we're conservative. Um, your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Um, yeah, I would say uh, most of our values align more conservative. Um, uh, most people do. I, I call most Black people that I know uh, conservative Democrats. <laughs> uh, we're conservative in value, but we only Democrat because most people told us to be. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's that's uh, where we are. Um, and I just think, you know, one side just does not do a great job in trying to to turn the tide or even just uh, reach out to the black community because most times you never see these people. We I've never heard of anybody from the conservative side because I never saw them in my neighborhood. Only people I saw in the neighborhood were, you know, uh, the Democrats, you know, and mm -hmm. that's something, you know, that's neither here nor there. But um, yeah, for the most part, I do believe most of, if all of our values are conservative, I mean, if you had a granddad and an uncle in the house, I can guarantee your, your, your family values are conservative. So you know, uh, but that's 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 where we are, man. And um, and I'm like I said, I'm grateful for how I was raised and my mom uh, for providing me with a father and, and my stepdad and him, um, you know, helping to raise me and my grandfather and the deacon behind the house and the truck driver mm -hmm. across the street and the guy down the street and I came to man we call pie man like all these men and women helped to mold you know who I am and I'm just uh, grateful for that um, right now. Um, and, you know, this is who I am. So, but yeah, definitely yeah. all those values are definitely conservative for the most part. Yeah, man, it is, uh, you know, and I know that we live in a different world, uh, you know, today, but, uh, but those are the things that I believe have made America great. Those are the things that have made uh, our communities great. And so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to put an invitation out. So sometimes when you, uh, when you want to come up this way, uh, I would love to give you and some of your boys a tour, number one, of Frederick Douglass's home in Washington, D.C., Cedar Hill. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a fantastic place. And then secondly, if we can make the time, we'll uh, take a little trip up to Nelson Mountain. That's where, uh, that's where my folks grew up and I'll uh, be, be able to I'll see be uh, a little bit of that. I'll be in D.C. Uh, June the 7th, I believe it is. I'll be there. Okay. I'll be there alone. I won't have my students, but I'll be there. But it'll be nice to, uh, to meet you all. Yes. It'd be great if we can make that happen, man. It'd be mm -hmm. great if we can make that happen. Well, look, man, let's uh, let's dig into it a little bit. Um, you are 23, but yet you started a school for boys. I mean, so when most most young guys are even just barely trying to get to college, you are already using the limited, I mean, you just had an associate's degree, but you are already using that to help educate the next generation. Tell us about what inspired you and what gave you the confidence that you could even do something like that. Um, well, I was raised to not believe I could be defeated. So I, you know, so people think I'm crazy because I like want to wrestle a lion and I want to fight an alligator and stuff. Like, I don't care. I don't think I can be defeated, which is good because God is on my side, but neither that's neither here nor there. Um, I, I believe I'm confident, you know, I'm confident in everything that I do. Um, but what inspired me uh, really was um, just trying to figure out my purpose um, at one point and just trying to figure out, you know, what I was here to do, even though I've been told what I was here to do. It just kind of dawned on me um, after I realized that after studying our civil rights leaders for some time and after studying a lot of these great people that have died and, you know, and died for us and tried to make things happen, they weren't in the business of training replacements. Um, and that's something I wholeheartedly believe in right now. Um, so before I get out there and, and giving speeches and what have you, we want to train up young men to, to go the way they should. So if you kill me or whatever you want to do nowadays, um, you're going to have to drop a bomb on a thousand other boys that I've touched and talked to and, and made an impact on and gave this same type of mindset too, but a better mindset. I always say, you know, people think I'm cool at 23. Well, I can't wait for you to see the boys that I raised turn 23 because they're going to be unstoppable. Um, and that's that's something that I wholeheartedly believe in. Um, and one of my classmates um, at the time, this is what pushed me to start working with children. One of my classmates when I was 18 got sentenced to 30 years in prison uh, and he got sentenced to those 30 years. Um, he wasn't at the actual murder. His brother committed a murder, but his brother had him hide the murder weapon and uh, he got charged 
also in that and he got sentenced 30 years 18 years old and i'm in court with him and they they offer people to come and say stuff you know on his behalf and i'm just like do we got anything place we can send him like i mean i don't he's not a bad person he was great in school whatever like that is there anything we could do send him somewhere rehab whatever and they just like no and i'm just like so we don't got no type of real programs down here to really try and, and help these boys get off the streets and i'm talking about being consistent i'm not talking about coming to talk to them for an hour or nothing like that i mean like like real consistency um in a program and they were like no and that's when i decided i was gonna start working with children um so i started out taking young men to um atlanta um to the civil center for civil and human rights in the african-american history museum i i rented some vans uh sometime and that's how i made it happen I will say at that time, I didn't know anything about um, actual organization or anything. Like I said, I was just a 19 year old kid. So I ain't have no emergency contact forms, no allergy information, no field trip permission slips, nothing. We just riding. Uh, but I, I'm grateful for parents believing that a 19 year old kid at that time to you know help their children. And I told them I was going to teach them how to be men. After that, I started teaching boys how to change oil and brakes. Um, I used my uncle's house. Um, and we would go out of his garage and, you know, I put advertisement on Facebook like, hey, I'm going to teach some boys how to change oil and brakes at this location. Come drop them off and, and we'll handle them. Again, no permission slips or nothing, no injury waivers or nothing. We just out it. there working. Um, and, you know, that's where we that's where we were. That's why I started it. Um, I lost my job um, in April of 2000. And, uh, I think 2019. I, I lost my, my job. I fell asleep uh, on the uh, in the bathroom. I was working uh, the graveyard shift um, at this plant and we didn't have anything to do that night. And I fell asleep and I don't even remember falling asleep, but they told me I fell asleep and they were trying to wake me up and I didn't wake up or nothing. And so I lost my job. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I think that was God kind of pushing me off of the cliff to go ahead and do what I was supposed to be doing and working with those children. So I started a summer camp out of my house at the time. Um, I went and got some tables. People uh, let me hold. I made my dining room into a classroom. I went and bought a little dry erase board that I could afford from Staples. And I taught there every day. Um, I taught there uh, finance classes, taught them um, math, reading, um, just uh, many different things. There's where I discovered that boys couldn't read or write. Um, and we have children, I had children ages 11 to 17 at that time. And trying to read and write with them was absolutely horrendous. I had a sixth grader who couldn't even read cat dog. Um, and that was crazy. I got seniors that write like they in third grade. I mean, it was crazy to me. And I'm like, how are you guys passing through school and you can't read and write? There's no way you're passing a test because you can't even read the sentence. There's no way. Like, how, how, who's passing you through here? I'm not understanding. And I told the kids at that time, I said, I'm going to open a school one day i'm not sure how we're gonna do it but we're gonna make it happen so i'll stop that there uh so we can ask more questions but that's kind of yeah. uh i mean I, I love the uh i love the visionary you know leadership i love the idea that hey look if nobody told me we can't do it we can do it so uh mm -hmm. that is uh that is amazing I, I gotta ask you though man so you're not that much older than these young guys and you were educated in the school system there in uh in albany what made your experience different than these guys that you're now that are coming through your school home um my mom and my grandma them they didn't accept b's when i was in elementary and middle school it was straight a's a bust that was it <laughs> so you know um that was that i always have been a great reader um i can write really well in theory not in penmanship uh, <laughs> I've never been able to write pretty, um, but all what they say all geniuses write sloppy because uh, I write terribly. <laughs> but um, but I can write really well and um, I can read really well, and that has always translated. Growing up, I won a couple spelling bees. Growing up, like I've always been uh, good with that. But that's because home was in order. We used to read the Bible with my stepdad and everything. Uh, growing up in school was always important. I've always been a good reader. Um, and just again, home, a lot of these children are missing home. Um, a lot of their moms are, are working and, and things like that. And, and they can't necessarily help that they're almost having to, uh, raise themselves. Um, right. and, and I, I can't necessarily too much fault their moms or anything cause they having to pay the bills. And, you know, um, that's, that's extremely important, um, uh, for them to see. And I think uh, if they missing home, um, they're going to miss a lot of that nurturing because school, 
can only teach so much, but you looking at 2023 where so much degeneracy happening inside of schools, I don't even see how learning even goes on anymore at school because every time I go visit schools now, it's just dege degeneracy all day. It's kids a lot to wear whatever they want. They cussing teachers out. They fight and they doing whatever. Like, this is all day, every day, not to mention all the electronic devices that they're allowed to have and et cetera. Like, I don't understand what's happening there. Like, we have only 39% of our children in our local school system graduated proficient in reading, and then only 19% of them are graduating proficient in math. But we have the highest graduation rate in the state. I think that's stupid. I'm like, how is that? How does that work? You're graduating functionally illiterate kids. Um, but yeah, these kids are missing missing home. That's what they're missing. Wow. Well, that is, uh, I would agree with you 100%. I mean, most uh, sociologists, if they're honest, when they are looking at the the troubling conditions within the country, but particularly in the urban community, it is absentee fathers, um, that, that they're not there to be able to provide the uh, the mentorship, the leadership, the direction. I mean, I tell people like this all the time. I was like, look, if you have kids in school that don't respect teachers, mm -hmm. uh, it's because they don't see a mother and a father. I mean, in my home, I saw my mom uh, respected my father. I saw when they had um, disagreements, they worked them out. So my, so I had a model of what uh, submission to authority looked like. Uh, they taught us that we should respect the teachers. They taught us that we should respect uh, the police officers. They taught us that we should respect the ministers. And uh, and if if kids don't have that, then uh, it's no wonder that we have a a generation that. Uh, is basically gone gone off the rails. Um, I want to ask you uh, this. So tell us a little bit more detail about your school. Like what happens day to day? So this is a private school that you run. Uh, how many uh, how many men, young men do you have in it? And what does it look like day to day? Because your approach seems to be uh, a little no nonsense approach. Tell us a little bit about what a day to day, you know, looks like in your in your school. Sure. Um, well, the school is completely free. It's a boarding school. Um, so uh, we're, we operate one of the only boarding schools that's free of tuition, that's not government funded. Um, mm -hmm. We have nine students uh, at our school right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we turned down becoming a charter school. Um, we were to, we would have been able to become a charter school, but I turned it down um, because I felt like uh, some of the vision would have been, uh, it would have just been uh, counterproductive to what we were trying to do. Sure. Uh, with our school um, and I, I really wanted certain things to happen if they couldn't happen then I had to have it my way um, but we have nine students um, every day the days look like they wake up at six o'clock in the morning usually they wake up at six o'clock um, they go out and they exercise every day um, I don't believe in obese children I think it's child abuse um, so any child that came to us you know that was overweight or having those issues because of weight they've all lost weight they are skinny now um, and that, that's what we believe in, um, healthy children. Um, so they work out every day and they look awesome. Um, we teaching them hygiene. So they, they work out, they go bathe, they brush their teeth, they're on their uniforms and square themselves away. Um, they eat breakfast, make sure they give everybody the proper greeting of the day, which is good morning. Um, we leave our boarding house, we leave the boarding house and go to our school offices. Um, our office building is where they uh, are working out of right now. Um, we're not working out of our uh, school building at the moment. It's only nine of them for right now. Um, so we're working out of our offices right now. They come here. They do their schooling from about 8 to 12 to start out. They eat lunch. After that, they finish from about 1 to 3. Um, after that, they go outside and exercise and play a little bit more, maybe throwing football, whatever. I do Bible study Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays along with my after school kids. Um, so they do Bible study. Say it again. I said, come on, get the word in yeah. there. Yes, sir. Oh, baby. yeah. Oh, yeah. So they're definitely going to do um, Bible study. That's something I believe in. Uh, it helps them out. Um, and also my after school kids come along for uh, Bible study. So that's um, boys ages 11 to 17. And it depends on what we're doing during those three days. We may do a workshop changing oil or changing brakes or what have you. And then we have, you know, spread field trips we'll do or whatever, um, like a normal school. They have normal breaks also. I, I do need to mention that they go home on their breaks. Uh, that the school system has. So summer break, uh, Christmas break, fall break, spring break, teacher work days, they go home. Um, but other than that, they would stay. And um, in the evening times, they go get squared away. They go bathe. They go make sure their rooms are straightened up. I go check everybody out, make sure their fingernails cut, toenails cut, everybody all hygiened up, making sure ain't nobody musty or nothing like that. They got their clothes good and out for the, the next day. 
and um go to sleep, rinse and repeat. That's right. it. Um, it's just and, and and the reason we do that um, because it seems like oh it's like the same thing. I'm like yeah it's supposed to be the same thing. Uh, I believe routines build habits, habits build character, and character makes the man. Um, that's what I believe in. One hundred percent, man. I could not agree with you more. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to go here a little bit. So uh, you see over my shoulder this picture mm -hmm. of Frederick Douglass, who uh, you know when I was a, a a little boy, my mother brought home these comic books. And um, there was one person out of all of those Black history comic books that had two. And that was Frederick Douglass, because he had lived a long, a long life. Mm -hmm. uh, he has been an inspiration to me for a host of reasons. I mean, I mean, everything that you're talking about from like, you know, reading the Bible, though, the Bible was Frederick Douglass's favorite book from uh, mm -hmm. he, he required his kids to memorize scriptures at the uh, at the at the table. Uh, but he also uh, was in, is an inspiration because he learned how to read and write. I mean, he basically got the the, the basic alphabets from you know his uh, mistress, uh, you know Sophia uh, Ald, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then he basically had a such a passion and a desire for reading and learning. He would uh, get the other little white kids, uh, you know, in his neighborhood. He would he would pay them or give them food to help him learn how to read and write even more. So. Who, who would you point to, um, you know, past or present as uh, somebody who is an inspiration for you or a role model that you try to, uh, to highlight to your, uh, your young men? Uh, for most people who are familiar with history, probably already know where I'm going. Um, it's definitely going to be Booker T. Washington and, of yes, course, Doc, Dr. King. Um, but uh, Booker T. Washington inspired a whole lot in me uh, after reading his book, Up From Slavery. Yes. Um, it is such a, a eloquently wrote written book um, that I told the students at the time, I'm like, why do we have to pull out a dictionary to read something a former slave wrote? Why does a former slave have a better vocabulary than I in 2023? It made me feel bad. Like how does a former slave read better than me? That makes no sense to me. I have steady access to books. I'm not under the threat of death for learning how to read. I'm not under the threat of death for learning how to count. I'm not under the threat of death for anything for that matter. And I don't know how to read better than he does. That's insane to me. Um, and that's why I really started digging into reading with my students um, and learning new words and doing vocabulary. Like, I mean, like we have to actually have a dictionary to read his writing. Um, Cause you don't know what some of some things he's saying. I'm talking about the, the words he would use. Like I usually could use context clues to figure out what he's trying to say, but you got to pull out a dictionary to read. So we would use some of those words as vocabulary words. Well, these are the words we're going to use because these are the words he said, and we have to learn what the words mean. So we stop and hold chapters in the book. Like we've taken so long because we having to stop and make vocabulary because these words, I don't even know, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm well read, I would think. So, um, but Booker T. Washington definitely inspired me, you know, becoming from, uh, coming from being a former slave to, you know, opening a school, you know, in Tuskegee. I mean, you can't get better than that. And of course, um, Dr. King, um, just um, the 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 resilience um, for me with him, um, it, it stands out. Um, and I always call him the most successful civil rights leader because the mission he had, um, I know people always just uh, have him thinking about integration and I have a dream speech, but he was so much more and his mission was so much more important to what he was actually trying to do and how he was able to accomplish that um through nonviolence. because of course the first thing we think is oh we should have fought back and all that stuff like that but the way in which he did it they're like oh dr king was scared no actually he wasn't scared for him to go to a town and that he's about well, he's about to say hey i'm coming to selma and they call you on the phone like yo we're gonna be ready for you when you get here you come stand them in the face that don't sound scared to me <laughs> it sounds like a man you know, so, but, you know, that's, that's where we are. I, I love Dr. King um, and, and his message. So the resilience that he had to stand up to, you know, those men um, un under the threat of death again um, is, is important to me. Um, and nowadays, the new assassination attempt is to, you know, find somebody to say something about you. Um, and that's what they do nowadays. So they don't kill you no more. They kill your character. Um, yes, but sir. even under the threat of that, I don't mind. You know, we're going to still do this work. 
Well, man, I'm, I'm so inspired by that. I'm going to go through a few more and then we're going to go to uh, some questions from uh, from our audience. But um, sure. so I, I want to transition a little bit to that that infamous uh, uh, time where you were on Roland Martin's program. <laughs> Uh, tell us what what set that up. How did uh, how did you get invited onto the program uh, first? Uh, what was it about? Um, well, I, I was a a minor fan of uh, Mr. Roland um, for a little while. I mean, I just kind of looked at a few of his things. It wasn't like sure. I was just you know watching every day, but I knew of him and I thought he was a good person or whatever like that. And I shared a video about you know some things that were happening in our community i was like i think we should start trying to do for self in our communities i'm like i think there are some things that we could do without asking the government for i'm like i believe that you know we keep waiting on the government to do for us things that we could do for ourselves and he retweeted the video and called me an idiot uh and so i i come in and i was just like what is idiotic about us you know doing for self well we need you need to be promoting voting and blah 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 and i'm just like okay i mean i i understand uh you know that people need to vote i'm like but we still could do for self in our communities and so he was like um uh y'all come on the show and talk about it or something like that but the other guy didn't come it was just me and he wanted to talk about voting and stuff like that and i'm like listen i understand your fight i do i'm like but that is not my fight i work with children and i'm not about to stop working with children to go fight for legislation that is your part of the body the liver plays its part the lungs play its part the heart the brain everything makes the body work i don't believe that my work is any less important than yours um and even with voting rights i'm like i don't know what rights we don't have to vote but regardless you know because i don't know what dr kingdom was out there for if we don't have voting rights but Aside from that, I'm just like, if that's your fight, if you're, if you're finding issues with what's, ha what's happening over there, then we'll support you from our side. But don't tell me what I'm doing is, is not as important or I should stop or whatever like that because you are, you know, wanting to fight for voting. You do your fight and I'll do mine and we should be able to support each other. Yeah, man. I, I When I saw the clip, you know, and heard about it, I was, uh, I was so proud. Uh, you know, I, I've met, you know, Roland a number of times. Um, I've been invited, but I've never been on his program uh, because I think, you know, nowadays it's just, uh, it's a lot of nonsense to be perfectly honest with you. It's not, yes. it's like for entertainment value, it's not really uh, to help educate people primarily, um, you know, so I, I just, but I, I was proud of what you did. And, um, you know, look, I want to, I want every person and particularly black people to, you know, find their path. Uh, achieve, you know, success. Uh, but I think that we do have a responsibility to, uh, before God and before uh, society, to uh, to do our part to help others. And I think that there's there are better ways to do that than uh, than tearing people down. And that was the part that uh, you know I, I was really disappointed that it seemed that he was trying to tear you down. And I can't get with that. Um, how did that make you feel? Somebody that you kind of like, you know you know, looked up to as a, you know, to a degree prior to that, you know, you said that you kind of liked some of the things that he had done and some of the things that he had pushed, but how did that make you feel when you had somebody who has this platform in the black community and uh, he essentially tried to attack you? It seems what, what it was to me. Um, well, at this particular moment, I would say um, I had become used to um, older figures in the black community attacking my work. Um, it has happened with a few prominent, you know, black leaders who have had something to say about me or whatever and these are people that i've looked up to watch their stuff and some of them even inspired some of the work that i've tried to do and to have you know them say things about me and things like that it, it, it was mind-blowing but at the time you know um i just was taken aback again by you know some of the older people who weren't like trying to help but you know at the same time respectfully saying a lot of them haven't been where I'm trying to go and that's fine. And it, they won't understand the vision. Um, sometimes you have a new vision that nobody's seen before and you have, you probably are the only person that's going to get it done. Um, if they're not trying to help you get there, then obviously God doesn't have them in your life for a reason. So I continue to keep moving, even including some of the, the local leaders in my hometown who always have something to say, you know, he's too young and what does he know about this and that, you know? Um, so, but you know, that's where we are. Well, uh, I'm gonna ask this two part question, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to something else. So, number one, um, Sanford Bishop, uh, have you met uh, the congressman? What's your relationship like with him, if you have? 
Um, I've never uh, met him. I've sent him a few letters before. Um, I haven't gotten a response. Um, but I, I, I think I met him before, but not like he knew who I was or anything like that. I just kind of sure. might met him and saw him before. But I've sent him letters. Um, I know uh, John Ossoff is a fan of ours. <clears throat> uh, Freddie Powell Sims. Um, a few uh, leaders uh, uh, up in the in the Capitol who work in the Capitol uh, support mm-hmm. what we're doing from both sides, um, including good. Governor Kemp. Governor Kemp is a big fan of what we're doing here. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of, you know, relationships with friends across, you know, both sides of the aisle um, here in Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, that, that is great, man. Um, I, I really admire you for that. You have been, um, you know, in a lot of the things that you said tonight and even before, uh, generally affirming towards, um, you know, generations of the past uh, with your grandparents, you know, your, your uh, you know, your uncles and that. Um, but take a moment, you know, as a, as a younger person um, and not being overtly critical, but what would you say to people that are my age um, and older? What would you say that you, you would hope that we would do a better job of than you see us doing today? What I would say, um, I, I honestly respect why most people in your generation don't necessarily chastise anymore because children nowadays are dangerous. Um, but I feel like a lot of the older generation is missing that old teaching that they would give as a village and sometimes you can't because mamas don't want you to say nothing to their baby and etc like it's 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 a lot because i think a lot of things could be fixed by simply teaching etiquette i think churches should be shut down nowadays and only geared to young people you've been in church 60 years mama why, why are we still going to church talking about talking for you we don't need to talk to you no more we got kids at church i think church should be solely for youth almost and mm-hmm. maybe people 40 and under or so them older women at the church need to be teaching etiquette, how you sit, what you do, how you talk to folks. Same thing with the deacons. Y'all going to church doing the same thing every Sunday. Absolutely not. Y'all going in there, going to sleep, counting the money and, and going to eat out the church. No, go talk to them young folks that's in there. Have church with them. Talk to them. We don't need the pastor hooping and hollering every Sunday. I appreciate it. I love me about this church. I love me some hymns. I love me a good deacon down there saying the Lord's Prayer. But I'm sorry, we need to, again, get with you know, the times and try and train these young people. It's too many young people for us to, especially with the way the world's going now, we can't afford to be up here just doing church for us. I I disagree. It should be solely for children. There is no more teaching that you need at 70 years old. (laughs) I disagree. Um, I think God would rather you be helping, you know, train young people in the way they should go. And I mean, whole teaching every Sunday, every Bible study, like you go read the Bible at home on your own time. But when it's time to get to that church, them walls need to be for those children. Um, that's that's something I believe in wholeheartedly that should happen right now. Amen. Well, we got we got some preachers that are on this call. So I'm going to encourage uh, Apostle Colbreth and uh, Pastor Keith and uh, Pastor Eason and others to uh, to hear that. I, I, I agree, man. I mean, it says in Psalms that one generation shall declare thy mighty acts to the next. Uh, Absolutely. Jesus' whole ministry when he left the earth is said to make disciples of nations so he wasn't even just saying like the people in the in in your neighborhood but engage with the next generation to make disciples of nations jesus has a worldwide vision and uh he's expecting for us to participate man thank you so much uh for for sharing that and uh and we're gonna we're gonna take that to heart we're gonna take that to heart we're gonna uh shift in a few minutes to uh, we got some questions that we have in here but um number one before we go any further there are people that want to know uh, about your school is it a nonprofit? um or even if it's not how can they support the work that you're doing to uh, train and to empower the next generation of young men Sure. Um, our website is theexforboys.org, and I did put it in the chat. And for those of you who are social media savvy, um, all of my uh, handles on social media are at New Emerging King, and I'm putting that uh, in the chat also. Excellent. Um, but Excellent. everything you want to see about our school is going to be on a website. Um, for, you can go there to our website to see all of our photos, things I've taught the boys over the years. Um, some videos of things we've done. You can go there to see how to donate and not just donate monetary funds, but we got Amazon wishlist, Walmart, 
people could donate cryptocurrency, um, all those things. Uh, you can join um, our uh, email list to see what's going on. Um, yes, the school is a nonprofit. Um, and we also have an LLC also for different businesses we open um, uh, with our school um, because we do want to learn how to uh, fund our school um, through businesses that we open. Uh, we do mm -hmm. exclusively run off donors. Um, so our school is, is taken care of by people who like you all who love what we do and, and make sure I'm able to share our message, you know, here and there and across the, the international world. Um, so I definitely appreciate people that help us and just give, I got people that give a dollar a month, three dollars a month, because they truly believe in what's happening and literally all of it adds up to something. Um, so that's how people support what we're doing um, um, through at, on our website at the extravoice.org. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions. One that came in at early. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with a, uh, a book from a sociologist by the name of Richard Reeves, but the book has gotten a lot of attention recently. It's called On Men and Boys. Um, but out of this, uh, one of the things that he points out, uh, many supposedly successful programs in the country that are designed to help struggling young people work only with women and girls. Uh, mm -hmm. what what do you think makes your work so effective with young men and boys uh, when so many other programs are failing? Um, I will say to, to begin with, um, I do feel like there's a, a, a oversaturation of programs to work with young ladies. Um, we have a thousand girls programs here in Albany. It's a thousand girls, Inc., girls empowerment. This girl, And there's nothing wrong with that. I wholeheartedly think that girls need absolute empowerment, but to miss out on who has to be the leaders of their homes when they get older i think that's that's counterproductive you know to what's what's going to have to happen because these women that you're raising to be good women are going to have to need men to marry especially in this you know climate and um i believe if we don't raise good men then it's it's going to create an area of bad women i believe that if you have an area of bad women that's because you have an area of bad men um, because women by nature are going to follow the leadership of men. If there's no leadership or bad leadership, that is where they're going to go by nature of God. Um, and I believe that, you know, men, you know, sh should be being taught, um, especially by the village, because I don't know everything. So I'm going to let my son's football coach tell him something. I'm going to let his uncle tell him something. I'm going to let granddaddy tell him something, because I don't know everything, but I don't teach you what I know. But the village should be able to to teach. Um, but I will say my effective uh, my effectiveness has a lot to do with my age also. Mm -hmm. um you know again i'm i'm younger um and i'm almost these kids age i was 19 teaching 17 18 year olds but because yeah. i'm not a 35 60 year old trying to tell them what to do with their life you know it's different i can relate to them i can have conversations with them about sex or whatever girls whatever because i i was just there a couple of years ago you can't put nothing past me i right. just did that like I, I i did the same thing like it's so you can't you can't put that past me you know and being able to have conversations with them. And then also consistency. I, I do realize a lot of uh, men start programs um, for boys just for steady access to single moms, just being honest. Um, it's easy access to these single moms out here and they just trying to be hot. Um, that's just being honest, you know, and I personally don't like working with children that I know I can't be consistent with. For example, people will ask me to come talk to their kids all the time. I'm not coming to talk to him. Can you bring him to me consistently? Can I talk to him on a, a daily basis? Can I, can I get contact? Can you bring him to Bible study? Can he come on field trips? I cannot effectively affect your child by coming to talk to him for an hour. That makes no sense to me. I'm not coming to waste my time, yours or his. He needs true consistency. He's been that way for 15 years, ma'am. There's no way this one hour conversation is going to change his entire dynamic. He has routines he needs to build. He has habits that he needs to break and he has a character to mold. Um, so there's no way that I'm going to be able to help him. But consistency is what's going to do that um, for these children. And consistency is what's going to keep them uh, sane and growing. Um, we don't have any true consistency. I mean, you're asking for it to fail. Um, not one hour a week, not coming to holler at some kids, not speaking at a school. That's not going to help. You have to do true consistency um, with these children. And I believe every man should be responsible for one child that's, that's not his. Amen. That's strong. Uh, we have this saying that you can't have momentum without first having consistency. You've got Absolutely. to build that consistency. And if you're faithful with that, uh, you can ultimately have 
you can have momentum. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, some of the uh, some of the folks have asked about talked a little bit more about how you work with parents. Um, obviously, parents, you know, God has given uh, you know children to you know uh, a mother and a fa father. Uh, but what talk about the importance of working with parents? My wife and I uh, homeschooled our children. Uh, I was um, on the board for the National Black Home Educators, and we uh, were teaching the principles of you know empowerment. Uh, we had you know uh, families that you know didn't have a uh, you know a college degree, but they believed in imparting to their children, and they homeschooled their children, and their children became you know hugely successful because they imparted uh, biblical wisdom. You know the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then it takes biblical wisdom to displace that foolishness and it comes largely through the parents that God has given them. So talk to us about how you work with parents and encouraging them to be responsible in their children's lives. Sure. Um well it's 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 definitely hard to try and work with children if I don't have a relationship with the parents because I need them to reinforce some of the things that I am enforcing um at the school or in the after school program. It's definitely hard trying to work with parents who we butt heads with. You know, we've had some stories where we weren't able to help a kid because me and the mom didn't necessarily get along because they don't be want to be told that, you know, you're a lot of the reason that your son is acting this way. Well, mama, look at how you're mad right now. And I want you to look at the same facial expressions he make or the same hand gestures he do or some of the same things you're saying right now that he's saying. I'm like, you guys, you have to understand that if he don't have a man around, he's going to mimic whoever he's around. So a lot of that comes from you, you know, so sometimes I, I have conversations like that, you know, and I always tell mamas, if I can't tell you stuff like that, this ain't it. I'm going to tell you what's up, you know, but you got to want your child to be better. But after I explain this to most, a lot of parents, they're like, I ain't even noticed that. I'm like, you see how you toot your lips up? He doing that same thing. He like, literally, I'm like, y'all, y'all mimic each other like a mirror. He's being disrespectful and talking back. Okay. Does he hear you do that to your mama? Like, I'm like, again, you know, just pay attention to you know what's happening at home you know and um if they if i can't necessarily tell the parents like hey make sure he's making his bed make sure he do this in the morning he already know to do this and that make sure you give the proper green of the day etc make sure you are, are enforcing these routines and habits at home then you know I, I can't work with them if they don't if they don't do that um but most parents i work with are awesome we try and, and have um, people work with them, you know, behind the scenes. We've had classes for them on opening businesses, building credit. Um, we help some of them with their bills or whatever like that. You know, we we try our best to assist our parents with what they need, helping them get jobs, um, et cetera. So we, we've definitely uh, done a lot uh, with parents. And speaking of parents, my mom is on the call. So, but yeah. <laughs> yep. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to give a, a nice shout out then to uh, to your mom. Uh, I had a great mom uh, and a great dad, uh, but uh, you know, as I said earlier, one generation shall praise the mighty acts of God to the next, and um, uh, I'm sure she's she's proud. A um, few other things before we get ready to uh, to end this call, man. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, I, I was listening to one of the interviews uh, that you did. And, uh, you know, people try to pigeonhole you sometimes. They try to put you in this camp or in this camp. Uh, you know, I, I try to tell people I'm in a Jesus camp and I try to follow mm -hmm. the pages in between the words, you know, uh, of the Bible. And then as a natural example, I always try to, you know, point to and, and use Frederick Douglass, who wasn't uh, a perfect man, but who was a great, uh, great example as a minister of the gospel and abolitionist uh, and somebody who uh, who loved his family and also uh, he had to challenge. He had to challenge people. Uh, he mm -hmm. challenged black people and white people, uh, and I know that you yep. have to do that too. But talk to us a little bit about. Um, uh, I'll just say it this way: somebody tried to uh, put you, lump you in, and basically say, "Hey, you, you, you're with Candace Owens," and so they tried to, you know, bash, you know, Candace Owens, and say, "Well, if you, if you like her, then, uh, then you can't be good." And then they try to put you with other people. Talk to us how you try to navigate, you know, as now becoming a more public figure, um, how you navigate those of trying to be put into one camp versus another camp. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess I'll say I just don't navigate it. I just say what I say and I keep it moving because people are going to spin your message every way in which way or however and say you with this person or that person, especially in now, nowadays. 
I just let people say what they want and I continue moving. All press is good press. So if you got something bad to say, somebody gonna come try and see who I am. And they either may love me after coming to find me or they may not. I mean, it's, it's on them, but I try not to get into this tailoring my message thing anymore. Like I used to try and, um, you know, try and tailor it to make people not be upset and not mess with this camp or that camp. I don't have time for that anymore. I'm a grown man. I'm going to say what it is, you know, that I believe is the truth. And if you get mad about it, it's totally fine with me. You know, as long as I believe it's the truth, you know, from God, that's what we're going to say. Um, and, and I don't expect it to, uh, you know, make everybody happy. That's and that's OK. Um, but, yeah, people going to try and put you in a thousand different groups. I'm in my group. I do what I want to do and say what I want to say, you know, and, and that's what I believe in. Um, I think that everybody should be able to say what they want to say without being lumped in. And, and honestly, people just don't like folks half the time just because they told somebody told them not to like you or like them. And, you know, people don't have their own mind nowadays. Like, oh, I heard this. Oh, OK, that must be true. Like, I mean, it's. It's, it's insane, I mean, but that's what in, we are. In, in, in this culture, I mean, people get successful off of tearing down other people. And so mm -hmm. it's like you can become successful by just beating other people down. And so uh, that's, that's, that's not ultimately the uh, what's going to be successful for, uh, for the end game. Um, hey, man, we have just a few minutes left. Anything that you want to to tell our audience or say that you haven't, maybe something that I didn't ask that you say, hey man, this is really important that you want to say to uh, to our Frederick Douglass audience tonight. Um, I will say, um, I know people always want to do something in their communities, but people always feel like they have to be doing something like like major, like opening the school or, or buying people cars or whatever like that. You don't have to do anything super gigantic to make effective change in your community. Uh, just today, I, uh, I, um, this homeless man came and asked me to buy some pork skins out the store. And um, I, I, yesterday, and it's crazy how God works, I, I um, had, got my clippers repaired yesterday and, and they were in my truck and I usually have them at home, but they were in my truck still. And um, you know, this lady um, at Dollar General fussed at me for buying him you know, what he wanted out of the store. And um, she fussed at me and I was just like, well, I just want to be a blessing or whatever like that. But anyway, I went and bought her some t-shirts and, and socks and underwear and stuff. And I cut his hair uh, outside of an abandoned building. I, it was a trash can out there. I turned upside down and I cut his hair, whatever like that. But people always think it's got to be something major. I'm like, you could just find somebody every day to make smile. Do something for somebody every day that makes them smile. Um, and, and even if for a man, like I said, every man should be responsible for at least one child that's not his. Find a family to feed you know, uh, once a week or twice a week, you know, find a kid you see walking to school every day and go make friends with their parents and say, hey, mama, you know, um, I've been seeing him walk up and down the street. And, you know, if he's comfortable with you, I could sit down and have dinner with you so you can get comfortable. I would like to take him to school every day and just try and mentor him and, and help him out. And, and if I, he need help with anything, I can help buy him some school clothes, whatever, like anything like it's you can do something. I call it the do something plan. That's the plan. Do something. Um, that's what I believe in. You can do something in your community to affect change. It ain't got to be opening no school, whatever. And then for people who do want to homeschool, I always say start a homeschool group. I know a lot of people try to do it on their own. Find 10 other like-minded people who want to homeschool. Yep. Well, on Monday, y'all go to Miss Valerie house and everybody send the kids to Miss Valerie house where everybody, all the other moms go to work. If Miss Stephanie off on Tuesdays, we send all the kids to Miss Stephanie house on Tuesday and everybody get food and it's a, a whole bunch of free homeschool programs online to keep them up to date with their high school and diplomas and you can bring you know all the kids to their house everybody eat over there and then everybody can pick their kids up and same thing through the week you can make it a, a home school community group thing. school yeah you know? yeah so you if you want to do something you will do it and you will not make any excuses about it you will do it if you truly want to um, that's what I believe in. But I always say um, at the end of every call or any interview I get on, we have a local hometown hero rapper. Uh, his name is Cantrell. He says obstacles are optical illusions. They're not really there. Jump high anyway. Jump high just in case. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, King Randall, thank you so much, bro, for being on this program. It is uh, refreshing. Uh, we are going to find more ways to uh, to help you do what you're doing and hope that it's an inspiration to other young men and women around the country to be innovative in their approach uh, to making a difference in their culture. I'll turn the rest of our program back over to our capable hands of Apostle Arnold Culbrin. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Brother King, man. We appreciate you and what you're doing and uh, brought back so many memories. 
you know, growing up in the church in the community in which I grew up, you know, yes, we, had, we had etiquette and we had those kinds of things, even in the church, just like you said, the older women and the older men would teach uh, the younger women and the younger men. And uh, we've got to get back to some of those things. Uh, I will disagree, however, that when you're 70, there's nothing else you can learn. When we talk about this <laughs> God and how deep it is, uh, we're always learning and our minds are being open. But I take this through what you <laughs> We are praying with you. We're rooting you on. We're here for you. Uh, Thank you. There might be a prayer request or something, you know, as we move forward that you want to reach to to this um, this extended village that you've now connected with in the Douglas sure, yes, sir. Institute and the Frederick Douglass Foundation. We are here for you. Keep doing what you're doing. Again, yes, sir. I'll thank send. You. Amen. I'll, thank you. I'll send you guys my cell phone number too, um, and then I'll try and come meet uh, um, the dean um, in June. I'll be in Washington on June seventh, so I'll try and come and meet uh, um, dean. I think that'll be fun. Amen. Amen. That's Amen. awesome. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's been a, well, you getting ready to say something, Bishop? Yeah, I was going to say before we, uh, before we close out, just to make mention that um, for those of you who are interested, uh, the Douglas Leadership Institute will be hosting our Juneteenth uh, event uh, here in the D.C. metro area. Uh, be on the lookout for details that will be on uh, June 19th. Uh, we're blessed to have the Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears, who will be with us along with a few other guests. And so if you are uh, in the Washington DC area, we would love to have you join us at our Juneteenth Jubilee event that will take place on Monday, June 19th. Thank you, sir. Back to you, Arnold. Amen. Wow, such an inspirational call. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your servant, King Randall, Father God. We thank you for all of the inspirational work that he's doing. God, we pray that you would use this rebroadcast to inspire, to encourage, and even to challenge and convict people that, that look at it, Father, and perhaps are maybe, uh, maybe got stalled or stuck somewhere along the way, got frustrated or got offended, oh God, but you've put this same kind of burden and passion and multi-generational perspective inside of, Father God. Would you cause this dialogue to reawaken something, Father, not only in them, but in us as well? Bless every individual, every church, every family, every organization, every ministry that's represented on this call. Bless King Randall to continue to do phenomenal things, Father, through uh, the X for Boys uh, program. God, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. God bless you all. Have a fantastic evening and rest of your week.